imagination connoisseurs once again it is well i've been renamed i am no longer the sanctimoniously notorious or the notoriously sanctimonious i have become uh the master of fun and wonder john campy called me the master of fun and wonder and to begin of course what do i got here i got i got gilbert here ladies and gentlemen he wants a cookie and because gilbert knows that i am truly Aren't I the master of fun and wonder? I know you think I'm always the master of fun and wonder, don't you? Especially when I have the cookies here. You got to do it in the. Come on, it's an ASMR. It's a Gilbert ASMR video. Yeah, buddy. Yes. And of course, your sister Tallulah gets a cookie, even though she doesn't come up. You don't get to just have all the cookies. I know you're going crazy for the cookies, huh? Let her have a cookie, huh? Anyway. All right, buddy. All right, buddy. You little apricot fiend, you. Yes. Yes. Now get down. Get down. Good boy. Get down. Good boy. Get down. You're a good boy, and you're a good girl, Tallulah. Back to the show, ladies and gentlemen. They don't call it show friends. They call it show business, don't they? These dogs need to learn that, by God. Well, first of all, welcome back. Uh, now that I am the master of fun and wonder, which I will take. I will take that. It's great to be back here on Tuesday. I've missed two days. I apologize for that. I had work to do yesterday. I was working on Labor Day. Uh, on a show I can't talk about, but but you'll know about it in 2020. Anyway, uh, it's great to be back here. Thanks for being here. This is, once again, Rob Observations. I am your host, Robert Meyer Burnett. Rob Observations is, of course, the show about something. And I'll tell you, I hope you had all a great holiday weekend. As many of you know, this show is brought to you by Lucky Tiger Men's Grooming Products for those men who want to look good and feel great. And, of course, their tailgating giveaway is now over. But if you go to their website at getluckytiger.com, you can still get 20% off of your order of their great men's grooming products if you punch in PGS for Post Geek Singularity when you check out. And you, all of you who are here today, today, today can I speak? All of you who are here right now are imagination connoisseurs and members of this, the Post Geek Singularity community. I want to thank you all for being here. It's great to have you here. It's great to be back. Uh, I, I missed a couple of days. I missed Friday. I was working. Uh, we were recording more episodes of, of course, the Inglorious Trexperts, and that is for Dean Devlin's Electric Surge Network. I actually got to see Dean. Dean came in, came in and talked to us, told us how much he liked the Inglorious Trexperts podcast, and explained that our video version of it because we have recorded every episode so far of the Inglorious Trexperts. We recorded season two's opener. We've done 50 episodes already. We did episode 51. I, I am a recurring guest on the Inglorious Trexperts podcast, but you will be able to see the video versions coming up. I don't know all the details, but they're going to be on various streaming networks and in, including the electric app that uh, that Dean Devlin's company is making. So that is very exciting. I've been uh, very fortunate to be part of of Darren Dockerman and Mark A. Altman's Inglorious Trexperts podcast. It has been a lot of fun. I mean, I got to be on shows with everyone from Walter Koenig to Jeff Combs to Rafe Needleman, who at 13 wrote the Star Trek trivia book that came out in the wake of Star Trek, the motion picture. We, of course, have been celebrating throughout this year on the Inglorious Trexperts the 40th anniversary of Star Trek, the motion picture, which occurs on May 7th of this year, May 7th. Pardon me, December 7th of this year. December 7th is not necessarily a day that will live in infamy, although it will. It is also the day that Star Trek The Motion Picture opened in 1979. That is December 7th. So that's very fantastic. By God, and we've been celebrating it. It's been a lot of fun. So, you know, I've missed out on the last couple of days. I've, I've, I've been getting a lot of comments. Obviously, I want to say welcome to all of you new subscribers. If you like these chats, Hit like. I mean, somebody already gave me a down vote. They they gave me a thumb down, a thumbs down before I even went live. Is that really fair? I suppose if you just hate my guts, but that's okay. Uh, go right ahead. But if you like these chats, please hit like. Please hit subscribe because it helps the old YouTube analytics, doesn't it? Indeed. Anyway, a lot of great stuff has been happening. I don't know if anyone has caught the new Dark Crystal. Uh, the new Dark Crystal TV series 
is astonishing. Uh, I, you know, I haven't finished it, but those people who've watched it all the way through and the reviews it's getting, it is truly an astonishing achievement in from in every aspect. Now, uh, it's beautifully designed. The integration of of live action and puppetry and CG and all of that is amazing. Uh, Louis Leterrier uh, directed every episode. Kudos to the whole Henson company. Uh, I cannot say enough good things about the Dark Crystal. I can't even believe it. You know, I always talk about how we live in 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 very wondrous times. If you're a geek or an imagination connoisseur, as you all are, because otherwise, why would you watch this show? It is amazing to me that the Dark Crystal exists. No expense was spared. It's unbelievably lavish. Uh, the creativity that has gone into every single episode uh, it, it astonishes me. And I, I just, once again, feel incredibly fortunate to be alive where someone finally decided to make a sequel to a 1982, basically, kids film, one of Jim Henson's, the great Jim Henson's, one of his, his, his life ambitions was to do The Dark Crystal. He followed it up with The Storyteller, uh, the man who, of course, created Kermit the Frog. Um, uh, just astonishing, astonishing achievement. I mean, you know, and I, I keep thinking of people like Frank Oz, who who was part of the Muppets from the very beginning, what it must be like to see where the art form has come. And, and uh, just kudos to Netflix for financing it and for the Henson Company to make it and to stick to their guns. And, you know, one of the producers is Lisa Henson, who... I have to say, 30 years ago was hugely influential on me. And, uh, you know, I, I I haven't talked to Lisa Henson in 20 years, probably more than that. But uh, she was a huge influence on my young life in Hollywood. And she was very, very nice to me. And it's it's such a such a great thing for me to see what they have actually created with the new Dark Crystal. Amazing. Uh, on the same, I you know... I have to mention Carnival Row. Now, good on Travis Beecham. Carnival Row was actually based on a original screenplay that writer Travis Beecham, who also wrote Pacific Rim, which is another original screenplay, Travis Beecham created or wrote the script A Killing on Carnival Row, which has now been expanded to an Amazon series. Again, Renee Echevarria, who, of course, we all came to know on Star Trek The Next Generation, again, been writing for the better part of three decades. He and Travis Beecham uh, have managed to put this together. And I I think, I again, I haven't finished Carnival Row. Again, a worthy entry into fantasy television. Uh, again, uh, just a monumental achievement in terms of world building, in terms of just creating a new world we haven't seen before. And between the two, then you add to that the boys. <clears throat> uh, my God, do we have an embarrassment of riches if you are an imagination connoisseur and you're a fan of science fiction, fantasy, horror, all of these shows. I mean, American Horror Story 19, the 80s edition is coming up. There is, there is just an amazing amount of science fiction programming. We got Ed Astra coming down the pike, that new IMAX trailer. Uh, Ed Astra just premiered at the Venice Film Festival. It's been getting rave reviews. Same along the Joker, blowing everybody away. You got it, Chapter Two, in theaters opening this weekend. You know there is just an embarrassment of riches now, and and I, I'm so happy to be living through this time where there is so much great stuff available. Uh, if you're an X Men comic fan and gave up the X Men. I strongly suggest you pick up Jonathan Hickman's new run on X-Men. He is he's writing two series concurrently, House of X and Powers of X. And not only is it some of the most, I would say, some of the most, if not the most, audacious X-Men storytelling. And I can't say it's the most because he is drawing from the last 40 years of X-Men lore. I mean, back to the, of course... You know, the Claremont runs, Grant Morrison's run, Scott Lobdell. I mean, how many great writers have worked on X-Men? Of course, Chris Claremont really laid the groundwork for all the modern X-Men. But, I mean, we're the new X-Men run, the House of X, Powers of X storyline, you can wait and get the hardcover when it comes out in December. But, my God, unbelievable. There's just incredible stuff happening across the board 
if you're an imagination connoisseur, really, really exciting time to to be uh, loving this stuff. You know, the movie Fast Color, which not entirely successful, but a, a very interesting take on the female superhero genre. Uh, really, really interesting. That that recently hit Blu-ray. Uh, you know, there's just there's so much good stuff out there. And it's all very, very exciting. Which brings me to the topic of today's conversation. As you well know, as anyone, besides being the master of fun and wonder, and besides being the sanctimoniously notorious Robert Meyer Burnett, as many people know, I am the gatekeeper of verisimilitude. No, I didn't call myself that. That was, that was a title hung on me. Uh, and what is verisimilitude once again? I'm always talking about verisimilitude. Verisimilitude this, verisimilitude that. What is verisimilitude? Well, it's it's taken from a Latin word. And I again, I don't speak Latin. It's basically the Latin version is like verisimilitudo. Like I said that in some kind of a Latin accent. I don't know how to speak Latin. But, but basically, the idea of verisimilitude is something like a story, something that is make-believe that appears real that has a quality of reality to it. Now, I have always believed that because I've loved science fiction, fantasy, and horror all of my life, that all of these things, all of these flights of fancy are better the more you can suspend your disbelief. Now, what can people put in things? How can filmmakers or authors, there can be verisimilitude in comic books as well. It all has to do with the believability of the storytelling and within, whether it's a novel, whether it's a comic, whether it's a television show, whether it's a movie, do the creators make you believe in the worlds that they create? Now, what does that mean exactly? And I've been, I've been, my feet have been held to the fire and a lot of people have been taking me to task like, well, Rob, how can you believe in this and not believe in that? First of all, let me just say that like Fox Mulder, I want to believe in everything. I want to believe in everything. Now, for instance, let me tell you about something I didn't believe in. I'm going to use the Fast and the Furious franchise. Those of you who know the Fast and the Furious franchise have often heard me talk about the fact that Fast Five is the Citizen Kane of the Fast and the Furious franchise. And the Fast, the sixth film, the film that follows up Fast Five, was still pretty good. But a lot of people talk about the end of the film, the climax of the film, which takes place on an airport runway with a military transport. And here's the thing. Many of us, most of us, a lot of us, I don't want to presume everybody, but if you've ever flown on an airplane, if you've ever flown on a jetliner or a small plane or a military plane, if you have ever flown, you understand the length of a runway. You understand how long you're in a plane as it taxis and then it moves into position and how it speeds up and eventually has enough speed to be carried aloft by the laws of physics. We all understand that. And at the end of The Fast and the Furious 6, a movie that stretches credulity even since the first entry into the franchise. So it seems crazy that I'm pulling this out as an example. But a lot of people say, as did I, the whole action scene at the end of that movie when they're attacking a plane and there's all kinds of stuff happening on the runway before this plane takes off, that the runway is the world's longest runway. Because there is no runway that's as long. Nothing could take place on this runway. They, there's, there's no way what we see in the movie could have actually happened because no runway in existence on the planet Earth is as long as the runway needed to stage the action scene at the end of Fast and the Furious 6. Now, I have bought into the Fast and the Furious franchise up through those, those uh, up, up to 6. Do I believe that two two cars can can carry a a a vault that weighs probably many tons down a street and fling that fling it around uh, in in Brazil like it does? Yeah. Now I inherently know that those cars probably couldn't carry a vault, 
that weighed as much as that ball would have to weigh, much less fling it around the way we see it. It, it. I don't think they could move it at all. Not a car. Car doesn't have the kind of leverage it would need to be able to it would just sit there and spin its wheels. I know that. But it's made me believe. I'll watch that movie, and because I've bought into the franchise, I'll believe in that. I'll believe in, in the end of Fast and the Furious 5. Fast 5. I'll believe in that even though I know it's not true. They've made me believe. See, within the context of that franchise, there is a there is a level of belief they get from me. There's a level of belief. And, and in Fast Five, I'll buy off that those cars can carry that vault, even though it's patently ridiculous. But in the context of that film, I bought off on it. I can't really explain why. There's probably many, three a three-dimensional a uh, chart, a CGI chart could explain it and probably give you a hundred thousand different data points as to throughout my life, what was I willing to believe and what was I willing to not believe? But at the end of Fast 6, I didn't believe it. I was like, there just isn't a runway long enough to facilitate this action scene. I mean, it literally got to the point where I'm watching, I'm like, come on. I, I, I was completely taken out of the movie because of how long that took. And because I know, and the root, remember, the root of all verisimilitude, the root of all believability comes from the fact that we live in the real world. So we are surrounded by, say, physics. We know if something heavy is dropped from a certain height, that it's going to do something when it hits the ground. Now, using that as a baseline, extrapolating upon that, we know how gravity works. So if we watch something in a movie that defies gravity as based on uh, uh, the way as based on what we understand living in the real world, our own experiences are what shape us as far as what we're going to believe. Now, uh, authors or filmmakers or television producers assume many things. So when someone is creating a fantastical environment, whoever's doing it, um, they know that there is a baseline reality that all human beings are part of, that we inhabit this physical world, and there are rules. I mean, let's talk about a, a physical rule. Light. Light travels 186,000 miles per second so far. And look, for all of you quantum physicists out there, you want to take me to task for this, that's fine. But for the most part, we pretty much know theories of relativity as proven so far, or maybe it's just a theory. It's a theory, so we don't quite know. But let's just assume for a moment that our understanding at our current level of science is that light basically travels 186,000 miles per second. Now, when we're talking about FTL drives, faster than light drives, whether it's Battlestar Galactica, whether it's hyperspace of Star Wars, whether it's the warp speed of Star Trek, the reason that we even have any kind of concept of ships traveling faster than light is because if you were to set a story anywhere in outer space and you have any rudimentary knowledge, understanding of how long distances are, distances are between one planet to another, <laughs> we would never get anywhere. The idea of faster than light travel had to be created by authors who work in science fiction because that was the only way we could explain how anybody could travel from one planet to another willy-nilly. Otherwise, it would take years, if not centuries or, or generations, millennia, to go from one planet to another, depending. So we have impulse drive, which is not quite faster than light. You have warp speed in the Star Trek universe, which is apparently the speed of light cubed. So warp one is one times one times one, the speed of light. Warp two is two times two times two, the speed of light. Two times two is four, times two is eight. And so what is warp nine or warp eight, whatever it is, 512 times the speed of light. So you can extrapolate and travel there. So that seems relatively believable because we also know that anybody who understands the distances between planets or stars, if you understand that, you are willing to buy into the concept of faster than light travel because if you didn't, you would have no story. So then it becomes part of the author or the architects, whether it's 
men or women, young, old, whoever is building, maybe even AIs are going to start creating fictional worlds that we're going to believe in. But we understand, first of all, as audience members and our, our favorite authors who are working in the science fiction genre, we, are, we buy into the fact that there's faster than light travel. There has to be, otherwise there's no story. Nobody could go anywhere. Now, there have been some really interesting ways that certain authors have got around this, like jump gates. Uh, I want to say it's called a farcaster, but but Dan Simmons, one of my favorite science fiction writers, in the Hyperion Canto stories, they basically have portals that you can travel from one place to another. Like there's a giant river and there's like a portal and you go through and it goes from one planet to another instantaneously. Dune, the guild navigators fold space from one place to another. There's always, a, but, but, so we understand that faster than light travel has to be true or reality warping or some kind of fantastical thing that is based on a pseudoscience that we can believe in. Now, we begin with being faster than light. We understand light is a constant so far in the universe, and there are things that come along with that, like theory of relativity. You go The faster you close, go to the speed of light, time changes relative to your position, things like that. So authors have to start playing around with that and make it plausible. Make faster than light travel plausible. Now that's that's a pretty big that's a pretty big leeway. It's, it's a pretty big you've got a lot to play with there. Now hyperdrive, that's easy. You go you go you go faster than light into hyperspace. Now what is hyperspace? Well, they don't explain it and say Star Wars when the Millennium Falcon when Han Solo is 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 going to hyperspace you believe it but why do you believe it well because they establish rules about going through hyperspace you have to chart you have to navigate your way through hyperspace before you do it because if you just willy-nilly jump into hyperspace you might go through a star or you might run into a planet they explain in a few lines of dialogue they don't even have to show you Han Solo is just explaining it to Luke. He just lays it out in a few sentences, and, and he gives you rules. The rules of the Star Wars universe are there is hyperspace. Now, they don't explain, like, we're going, warp, we're going hyperspace factor four or hyperspace factor nine. They just say hyperspace. Now, we don't understand necessarily. Now, I'm not talking about now it's how, how it's explained to us later. I'm talking about just as it was presented in Star Wars, we believe in hyperspace because, okay, we know we need faster than light travel to get anywhere. We understand that. But they give us some rules. You know, because, yeah, man, if you don't plot a course through hyperspace and you bounce too close to a supernova, even though you're in hyperspace, you can't go through a sun. You know, it would still screw you up. So immediately what Star Wars does in, in, in A New Hope, in the original Star Wars, is it gives you enough to believe. And Star Wars does that. The first Star Wars is very, very good about creating verisimilitude. The set designs, the costumes, the way people react, everything about Star Wars makes you believe. J.R.R. Tolkien, same thing. I mean, J.R. Tolkien is talking about Balrogs and the Astari and the this, the immortal creatures and the elves and the like all of this stuff is patently absurd. None of it's real. You know, none of it. It's all it's all fantasy gobbledygook that came out of his imagination. But what Tolkien was so good at was creating enough detail around all this stuff. And everybody has rules. There's different languages, or who speaks Sindarin or whatever. There's so much detail within the fantasy world that it allows you to believe in all the craziness because Tolkien, he makes you believe because of all these details and the rules. People just can't do anything they want. You can't just, you're not just omnipotently magical. You know, you can't just like, I want to create a planet. Ching, there's the planet. You can't do that. Even magic and powers are governed by stuff. Like, hey, you get tired. If you're tired in real life, you 
your magic is probably not as potent as it is if you're, you know, not tired. So what's interesting in Tolkien is is James uh, James Herbert. James Herbert's a horror author, who I love, by the way, and recommend. Uh, I read his Rats, the first Rats book in in, in uh, summer, at summer camp, The Flying Horseshoe Ranch in Cleelum, Washington. But if you um, if you read James Herbert, not James Herbert, Frank Herbert, damn it. Frank Herbert, the author of Dune. So much of Dune, from its language to everything, is world building. However, it's all kind of based and extrapolated on from our own world today. So we buy into it. We believe it. Now, Star Trek, Star Trek has given us its, its fictional world for a long time, for a long time. And for the most part, I've believed in Star Trek. Now, one of the things, and to bring it back to something I cannot stand which is Star Trek Discovery. And people are like, why can't you, what, what, what's wrong with Star Trek Discovery? One of the things for Star Trek Discovery that I cannot, I can't get past. Now, this could be a shortcoming of my own, but Star Trek had created, we've had warp drive, we've seen trans warp drive, we've had all kinds of, there's been all kinds of propulsion systems in the Star Trek universe. And for the most part, I believed in them until Star Trek Discovery. And they asked me to believe in a spore drive. Now, where did the idea of the spore drive and discovery come from? Well, I'll tell you where it came from. It came from Brian Fuller's original concept of the show. Brian Fuller is, is obsessed with a Dr. Stamets, a man who, uh, 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 in real life, he is all about mushrooms and the micellular network and all of those things. We saw an interesting example of this in an episode of Hannibal. So the whole idea of the micellular network and, and mushrooms and all that was in his original concept for Star Trek Discovery used for terraforming. It was all about creating, quickly creating planetary environments that could be inhabited by humanoids. Cool, right? And he was dealing with the real science of all of this stuff. I'm into it. I believe in that. Because if you discuss or you 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 do any examination about fungi or anything like that, it's pretty interesting. And Dr. Stamets is real research. He's a real guy. When you start learning about or seeing how, how those networks develop, and especially in forests and things like that, fascinating stuff. So when you apply that on a planetary scale to terraform an environment to make it more hospitable for human life, it's like, okay, I believe that. Well, when Brian Fuller was let go, um, when he's no longer, when he was replaced as the showrunner for Star Trek Discovery, uh, the new people that took over, Alex Kurtzman and, and um, you know, uh, Akiva Goldsman and all the writers, used what Brian Fuller had created and changed it around to make it more theirs. And so this idea of a spore drive was created. Now, I'm sure that was also a bastardization of Frank Herbert's folding space. I mean, folding space from Dune, it's tough. You know, mutated human beings using the spice melange that can only be found on Arrakis become, well, spoiler alert, sandworms, god emperors. There's all kinds of stuff going on. But when, when they are mutated enough, third stage guild navigators can fold space. One position, uh, one point in space, and another point in space. They fold space, and then you could move instead of traveling through hyperspace. So the idea of this spore drive was born. That was probably a, a, a bastardization of Frank Herbert's Dune and Guild Navigators and this. But in my mind, in the Star Trek universe, we already had propulsion. We'd never heard of a spore drive. The show was supposed to be canonical and take place before 10 years before the original series. We've never heard of spore drive before. I don't even know why the, the producers of Star Trek Discovery would then base half of the stories in the first season of Star Trek Discovery, and then a lot of them in the second season were based around this idea of the spore drive. You, like that was to me, that was a waste of imaginative resources that you're going to change the idea of, of how you're going to go from one place to another. Why did you need to do that? 
And I don't believe you're traveling around, even though there's a micellular network on a planet, that's, you could do something and make that work out. Well, in my mind, I can't believe that you can travel through space on that. How is that network created? How does that work in space? My idea of verisimilitude shattered. Can't believe it because there's no, I can't believe that an organic system that can be actually looked at and examined on a planetary scale within the soil and how fungi and the micellular network works and all of that stuff. I don't believe you could ever make that apply to space, at least not organically, maybe some other way. Just didn't buy it. And then they double down. They have a tardigrade creature who was originally conceived of as a crew member, Ephraim, was part of the crew of the Discovery, is now somehow a creature, third stage guild navigator, is traveling through the micellular network somehow without a spaceship. Uh, this, this, this network is supposed to, you need energy to get in there. You need the power of a Federation starship in order to penetrate this. Then, of course, there's people living in that. I mean, it just went off the rails for me. Anyway, that's just a, an explanation of what verisimilitude is to me, just quickly, because I talk about this all the time. But the real task at hand is to make your audience believe, whether it's you're talking about magic like in Harry Potter, you're talking about the spice melange in Dune, whether you're talking about the Farcaster system, and I, I think it's called Farcasters, in, in the Hyperion Cantos, or hyperspace in Star Wars, or warp drive in Star Trek, or whatever, you need to give an audience enough that they like, okay, I can believe in that. Now, your level of belief, I think, is, is um, the more you know about, say, science, I think it's harder to make somebody who's maybe Willow Yang. One of, one of the great things, our great um, Willow Yang, who has been a longtime member of the Post Geek Singularity here. Willow Yang writes a lot of great reviews, and I'm going to read her her review. If you haven't gone to the website and checked it out yet, thebrennetwork.net, I'm going to read her review of Encountered Farpoint. But one of the things that I love about Willow is that being that she is currently getting a, a, a PhD in microbiology, uh, she approaches things, her verisimilitude is, her idea of verisimilitude is based on her knowledge of science. And when she sees something that's patently ridiculous, she can talk about it and accept it, but she's also coming at it from a position of, of knowledge and science, so it's harder for her to believe. She'll accept it, but it's harder for her to believe. Anyway, I, I and I appreciate that. So the more you know about certain things, I mean, you know, if you're a police officer, like our moderator, Detective Jim, if Detective Jim is watching a, a, a police procedural and he, he was a cop, then he was a detective, so not that a detective isn't a cop, but he worked his way up. He knows about police procedure. So if you're watching, say, one of my favorite cop movies, Internal Affairs, if you haven't seen Internal Affairs starring Andy Garcia and Richard Gere, it's, it's a really great cops gone bad movie. And I love it. But he would know, Detective Jim would know, like, you know what? This is bogus. This isn't going to, this, this is not how cops do things. I remember I had a friend of mine, uh, a guy, Chris Penny, who I went to. Who, uh, who I went to high school with. He was a submariner. He worked on a nuclear submarine. And I remember discussing a little bit of Crimson Tide with him. And he was like, oh, Crimson Tide. I love Crimson Tide. I thought it was great. I suspended, I, um, I completely bought into it. Completely bought into Crimson Tide. Well, he would break it down for me and tell me how Crimson Tide is not believable at all, especially if you're a submariner, because you would know everything that was BS in that movie. But here's the question. Here's the question. What's more important? Is verisimilitude more important to the story that's being told? Or is the meaning of the story, is the message the author is trying to convey, is that more important than the author making you believe in that story? I got a letter about this, and I've been thinking about it. I've been contemplating it. For, for days now, because I haven't gotten back to talk to you. And I was like, I'm going to read this letter because I've been thinking about it. It's been driving me a little nuts because I'm always talking about verisimilitude and I'm, I'm obsessed with believability. And even when you turn a camera on and get one shot 
you know what what is what are movies aside from a succession of shots that make you believe in their reality that's what every great director is trying to do make you believe and every single shot there's a chance that that verisimilitude will be shattered and it's hard to do so i've been obsessed with it my whole life the whole idea of it anyway mark p wrote me a letter and this is what i've been contemplating what this says about me as a person i don't know but now Hopefully, you can start thinking about this. Do you believe? Hello, Rob. I've been a bit of a lurker on your channel for a while, always enjoying the content you put out there and never really feeling compelled to contribute to the conversation. Sure, I disagree on some points here and there, but I'm not one to get fired up and throw my opinion into the mix until now. First, a disclaimer. I am a strength and conditioning coach. In between working with athletes, I like to dive into my geek culture. But I have no background whatsoever in film or writing. I can't write a position stand on what solid writing is, and I don't have the slightest idea of how to develop a good character. All I can present is my own subjective viewpoint and hope that you can steer me in the right direction. My inquiry is in response to your live chat number 209, where you gave several examples of when verisimilitude was shattered for you. In this case, you mentioned Star Trek, Star Wars Episode Six: Return of the Jedi, and The Dark Knight Rises. This letter is in no intention a defense of The Dark Knight Rises. I don't consider it a masterpiece, and I have some issues with it. But I still think it's a good movie. Your point of Batman being able to get back into Gotham broke verisimilitude for you. And I've heard a lot of people have similar issues with that. In this case, isn't the why far more important than the how? This was a man who was broken physically, mentally, spiritually, you name it. But now he was in a better place and ready to fight the good fight. Our hero is back and don't we all love to see a hero rise after falling? I'm just using that scene as a reference. I understand in the real world, sneaking back into that city would be damn near impossible. And I couldn't do that in my world. So the thought of a character making that trek and doing the impossible inspires me. I'm invested in the character. And it means something to me that he returned again. The why far far outseeds the how. I could take things a step further and say, Batman's a real jerk for using some lighter fluid and a match to ignite a makeshift bat signal on a bridge. I mean, there's a nuclear threat. He's short on time, and he also commits a lot of damage to that bridge. How in the world do you do that, too? But it doesn't take me out of the movie because of what it means. Yes, it's a cool visual. But it also, at least to me, is a way of showing me something rather than telling me. Bane's reaction, Batman being back, the city seeing that flaming symbol, it all conveys a lot of emotion that keeps me tapped into the movie. It is similar to that Star Destroyer hovering over a city in Rogue One, a Star Wars story. It makes me wonder of a time when that land was free and prosperous. How do the people of Jeddah, who live there, hold themselves up when that's the first thing they see in the morning, that Star Destroyer. Is there more crime? Do they hope for the fall of the Empire? Again, cool visuals, but it sparks my brain into going beyond what I just see on the screen. I could use other movies that you mentioned, but I don't want this letter to drone on. I guess what I'm asking is this. Is the why more important than the how? Do the rules of the world always matter? Curious to hear your response. No matter what you say, I love the channel and thanks for keeping me entertained while I walk my pup. Mark P. Well, Mark, I think first of all, this letter uh, has a great point to make. And that is everybody's different. Everybody's experience of a story or, or of a, a, an author's work, or a filmmaker's work, or a television producer's work, or a comic book artist and writer's work. Everybody has a different experience of that work based on who they are as people. 
Now, my idea of being the gatekeeper of verisimilitude is based on the way I see the world. It's different from the way you see the world. And what's really what I really loved about your letter was when you first explained that you are a conditioning coach. You said you work with athletes every day. Now, what is it that you're trying to do when you're working uh, with athletes or you're working as a conditioning coach? You're trying to get people to, to find something, find it within themselves to dig deeper, to push harder and further and faster, eat better foods, work out, you know, give, give me a few more reps. And, and, and you need the mindset. You've got to create within people a mindset with which to be able to achieve whatever it is their athletic goals are, whether you're dealing with professional athletes or whether you're dealing with whomever you're dealing with. That's what you have to do. And what's interesting about that is it's such a mental thing. It has to be, I mean, there's the physical aspect of it. Yes, people have to deal with the physical bodies they, they inhabit, but they also have to come up with the mental stamina with which to do whatever it is you're trying to get them to do. And that's an amazing thing. So I would, uh, as you pointed out, and I, I think, I think the, the, the idea of the dark night rises is a great example. You are looking at the world a little differently than I'm looking at the world because you're looking at a man who, like the people that you deal with every day, has to dig deep has to go within himself and 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 find the power. And we know he will because he's Batman. He's Bruce Wayne, right? But has to dig deep and finally, like, find the stamina and, and his back was broken and and climb to the top of that, that get out of that tower and get back to Gotham somehow. I mean, it, it's right in your wheelhouse. And you've seen it. You know, you've seen, I would assume, you've seen people go further and faster and dig deeper than they ever thought possible. And you've been there and witnessed it. So when you watch a movie like The Dark Knight Rises, metaphorically, it's going to mean something more to you. You are not, I mean, I love the fact that you brought up the example of the burning image of, of the bat symbol on the bridge, which Mike Bodden, uh, our, our great moderator, Mike Bodden, used as the thumbnail on your letter on the, on the, uh, on the website, on the burnetwork.net website. There was no reason for Batman to do that. In the movie, even I sat in the movie and was thinking to myself, I'm like, okay, first of all, how long did it take him to get the lighter fluid or whatever it was he needed to do to paint it on the side of the bridge? Like, how long? Was he flying around in the bat for a while and, and was he able to squirt lighter fluid? I don't even know how he did it. I don't know how he did it. And frankly, I don't know if it's necessarily important that we know because at the end of the day, how did that emotionally affect you as a viewer? And when I watched The Dark Knight Rises, I saw it. I was sitting next to a producer friend of mine named Adrian Iscaria, and I loved it. I loved The Dark Knight Rises. I just let it wash over me. It wasn't until I watched it multiple times, especially when I watch it on home video, where I realized that, oh, my God, there's a lot of stuff that, from a practical, realistic standpoint, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And that was one of them. Like, I get it. Like, Batman wants to announce to the people of Gotham that he's back. But when did he have the time to do that? Like, in the real world, if you wanted to put that kind of a, let's, let's say it's the Brooklyn Bridge, the Williamsburg Bridge, whatever. Let's say you wanted to do that on an actual bridge. How, how would you do that? How long would that take? And, and, and even if you had lighter fluid or whatever, would it... Would there be enough to burn the whole symbol or would it would the rest of the symbol could it get all the way around to ignite the whole thing so you get the full bat symbol? I mean, there's lots of things in movies like that that they full on they went for the effect. They went for that emotional moment. And it really depends on what kind of a person you are, whether or not you're gonna buy into that. Are you gonna buy? Do you believe? And, you know, there's a lot of people, if you look at the spectrum of people that exist uh, on this planet, the level of belief uh, is extraordinary, <laughs> what people are are willing to believe in. And in the case of a movie like The Dark Knight, The Dark Knight Rises, there's, in my mind, there was too many of those things. Like, how long were the police underneath Gotham? A hundred days? Who was feeding them? They couldn't dig their way out in a hundred days. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in The Dark Knight Rises that I think diminished the film as a whole because you're asking yourself, wait a minute. 
and and you get it, within a movie, you only get a few wait a minutes, or you, you get a few what we call asks. You get a few asks. You you ask the audience a few things, and if there's too many asks in a movie, the reality of the, the reality the filmmakers are trying to create breaks down, and that's what I am a stickler for. I want to believe. I don't like it when something happens in a movie that makes me disbelieve because it makes me feel that the filmmakers aren't, they're not paying enough attention anymore to their own work. I feel like they're letting me as a viewer down. And I wonder why have you done this? When you are watching as a film editor myself, I have poured over scenes for hours and hours and hours and hours. Even, even how, when you're, when you're making a movie and people are in a room talking to each other and somebody gets up and walks around the room and goes to the bathroom and comes back or goes to the kitchen and pours himself a cup of tea or whatever, you need to figure out how that works in the confines of a scene. And even if it's only somebody getting up to go get themselves a cup of water or tea or whatever, there's a certain amount of time that we all know transpires between someone getting up from a table walking into a kitchen, turning on a tap or whatever, and coming back. And if you're still having a scene around the same kitchen table or, or the same dining room table where this is going to occur, where you have to account for that time, there have been times when I've had to extend shots because the journey to the kitchen and back seems like uh, that was too fast. I mean, even things as innocuous as getting a cup of tea in a movie can shatter the verisimilitude of the entire film if you do not believe the amount of time it took for a character to get up, walk to the next room, and come back. So when you're making a movie, every single, every single, imagine, imagine you 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 pick your favorite scene in any movie, whether it's it's uh, just what the the thing that popped into my head was Indiana Jones sitting in that bar drinking alone after he thinks Marion Ravenwood is dead, you know, and there's that camera on him, he's like thing, and then Bella comes and finds him. Everything in that first shot, it's like a single shot looking kind of down up and he's drinking. Everything in that frame, everything in the frame, you got to believe it, man. You got to believe the room. You have to believe the lighting. You have to believe the people that are sitting behind Indiana Jones. You have to believe the table. You have to believe in the cut, the cup that he's drinking out of. You have to believe the way his shirt and his skin would look after he's gone through that ordeal with the baskets and running around and the explosion and all that. There's a million different decisions that have to be uh, achieved or, or, or implemented in one shot of a movie. One shot to make you believe, man, to make you believe. And imagine that every single shot of a movie has to have that. If, if the camera's in the wrong place, if it's too high, or it's just, it's a 50-50 and it, it's, the camera's just dead on, it's, it doesn't convey, the, 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 the actual camera angle doesn't convey enough emotion, scene doesn't work as well. That's why movies are magic, man. It's not just think about it. It's every in every frame. There's a, a so many decisions that have had to have been made correctly by everybody: the costumer, the makeup people, the set designers, the art director, the the every single person, the, the cinematographer, the director himself, the actors. Everybody has to be firing on all cylinders, and every single shot and every single movie cannot let you down. If one shot's wrong, you can shatter it all. But Everybody's different. Everybody comes to these things in, in different ways. And that's why I have so many people telling me, you know, Rob, uh, you really should believe that. Like, if you believe in Star Wars, why can't you believe that a capital ship can be hovering over Jeddah? Why? What? Because I don't. Because I'm a fan of science and I just don't believe. Give me uh, uh, part of the front, the fun to me of, of the Star Wars universe is they made me believe in capital ships because they don't land on planets. That's part of it. That's part of the universe. Capital ships can't function in the environment, the gravity well of a planet. That's why they're capital ships. You know, I don't, I don't believe, like I talked about the medical frigate at the end of Return of the Jedi. You know, Nebulon 1 or whatever. That ship was not built in the gravity well of a planet. It was built in orbit. Look at its design. It's outboard, mortar, fragile design. That couldn't survive the gravity well of a planet. Well, it could, you know, it could. No, because if you want to believe that there's any physics at all, you know, things have to be controlled by physics. I mean, again, maybe that's just me. Anyway, verisimilitude. My God, I've talked about this for almost an hour. But that's what I'm thinking. That's where I'm coming from when I talk about this. 
And, you know, I, I just want to say thanks to Mark P. Mark P., you might have been a lurker, sir, but you, you wrote a letter that I've been thinking about, that I'm contemplating. And the question that, that or the answer actually, is that every human being is different. Every person's different. However, the people that are trying to tell these fantastical stories on these fantastical worlds or set in fantastical realms like Middle Earth, they try and find a baseline of believability that most people, because we all live in the <laughs> physical world, you know, I know what's going to happen if you bash someone over the head with a rock. And if somebody has a really thick skull or they're monstrous and they can deflect, I mean, that's the whole point. When 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 a monster, when a when a, a werewolf is shot with anything less than a silver bullet, they'll get up. You know, I mean, you you believe that. You understand what it's like to be shot. Even if you haven't been shot, you get it. You understand the stopping power of certain calibers. So if a, if a werewolf's going to get up, you know, you got to believe. You got to believe. And they got to make you believe. Because if there's no rules, if and all of it's based in the physical world somehow, all, all of verisimilitude comes back to the world that we inhabit now. I think it's hard. I think it's important. I think it's hard. And I think that's what great fantasy writing does, is it makes you believe. And it's really hard to do. And I'm not saying you have to believe what I believe. But everybody's got a threshold. Everybody has a verisimilitude threshold. What's yours? What do you believe in? Where do you draw the line? And you know what? Everybody's different. I think really one of the problems, we talk a lot about Star Wars. I think one of the problems with the new, the, the Star Wars sequel trilogy is it does not have verisimilitude to the Star Wars universe. They have shattered their own verisimilitude. Star killer base. Death Star already told us. You know, Rogue One certainly shows us verisimilitude. Ah, the beam of the Death Star is not just one. It, it, it can be, you can you can bring the power of it down and attack a planetary target and not necessarily destroy the planet. I mean, there's verisimilitude there. So when you build a star killer base, you have the Death Star as an example of what the verisimilitude is. How does technology work in the Star Wars universe? Star killer base. A hyperspace weapon. I mean, we know we need hyperdrive to go into hyperspace. We've seen it. So how does a beam weapon, how does a beam weapon go through hyperspace? How does a beam weapon split into three and attack three planets? How does a beam weapon apparently get shot in one direction, but we get to see it in another? No verisimilitude. My problem with J.J. Abrams as a filmmaker is he does not care about verisimilitude. He doesn't care about it from a storytelling standpoint, a interpersonal standpoint, a human standpoint, or a storytelling standpoint in general. He violates verisimilitude all the time. And I think one of the reasons people have a problem with the new Star Wars trilogy, it's not that it's bad. It's that you don't believe it. Hence, you call it bad. But it's all, it's all very interesting. What is your threshold of verisimilitude as, as the master or the... Uh, yes, yeah, the master of fun and uh, uh, wonder. The beginning of fun and wonder for me is the beginning of verisimilitude. That's all I can say. Anyway, what do you guys think? Let's see. I know a lot of people have been firing in stuff. Uh, I, I get possessed sometimes, people. I get possessed. These chats get me possessed. I get all excited about these these things. I mean, if you can you imagine? I I spend an inordinate amount of time thinking about these things, contemplating them. I mean, what does that say about me as a person? I don't know, but I at least get to talk about it now. Casual Cups is here. Casual Cups asks, have you read any of the Ender's Game books by Orson Scott Card? Yes. I love the Ender's Game books, Speaker for the Dead. I, I am a huge fan. I read three of them, three of the Ender's Game books. The original, I think the original book books. Um, the Here's the thing about Ender's Game. Is, if anyone's seen the movie... In the books, the children that are co-opted to fight these wars are much younger than they were portrayed in the film. And there is sort of a horrifying element to that when you find out what's really going on, what these poor children have been forced to do really against or without their knowledge. Uh, they're great books. And look, you know, Orson Scott Card was, was I don't know if you want to call him outed, but he has some 
especially in the more left-leaning liberal world, the world I inhabit, I inhabit, he has beliefs that were sort of not seen as being the kind of progressive beliefs that many science fiction writers are supposedly uh, 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 espousing in their work. He, he came out and is not a lot of, he's been taking a lot of criticism. I don't think that that invalidates his work. I'm a huge fan of Ender's Game. I think it's one of the great modern science fiction novels. And anybody who has not read Orson Scott Card's books, uh, I think you should. I think those are great stories and I really like them. Uh, Gabriel Reed or Gabrielle Reed. Gabriel Reed says, why can't stairs be trusted? They're always up to something. That's a line that's, uh, that's, that's worthy of Stephen Wright. I like that. That's good. Mm. Well, I actually didn't answer the question of this chat. Is meaning more important than actually J.B. Bonifacio asks, would Jojo Rabbit be an instance where meaning presides over verisimilitude? It features Hitler as an imar imaginary friend, but it's ultimately a tale about a boy confronting his blind nationalism. Well, I don't know if it's about his blind nationalism so much as it's a boy who's just a boy who ends up in this extraordinary situation. I don't quite know if it's about blind nationalism yet. Maybe it is. I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't seen it. But what I the ultimately here's the thing. I got to answer the question that I'm that I'm positing at the uh, or or that I'm 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 coming out with or whatever you want to call it. The question I asked. The topic of this chat. The topic of of this chat. And and what did I actually say it was? It was about ver the, is meaning more important than verisimilitude? I would say both go hand in hand. Because I think that meaning, uh, people derive meaning if they, especially when I, when, when, remember, when I'm talking about verisimilitude and meaning, I'm speaking about it in terms of storytelling. I'm speaking about it in terms of flights of fancy. Can you believe in a story and have it have meaning to you if, it does a story have meaning if you don't believe the story? I don't think it does. I think the answer that I wanted to, to bring up was they go hand in hand. You need both. You need both verisimilitude and you need a great story to derive meaning from. I think the meaning of a story is diminished if you don't buy into it. Now, here's, here's I, I want to make a, 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 another point. Verisimilitude doesn't necessarily have to mean something is realistic. I love the movie Amelie. Amelie is a, is a magical realist film. However... The magical realism, the quality of life, that the the things that Amelie is is imagining, or or the things that are happening in her own mind, are established from the get go, in the way the story is told. Again, Amelie creates its own verisimilitude that is not necessarily tethered to reality, but you believe it because it doesn't become too untethered from reality. It creates a reality it creates Amelie Poulon's reality inside of that frame. And you believe it. Her flights of fancy, what she thinks happens, the animals that talk to her, whatever's going on in her mind, you believe it. So just like Middle Earth creates its own reality and 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 all of these great authors and, and people can create their own realities and you can believe in them. So I'm not saying that something has to be tied necessarily to the real world. So... When it comes to Jojo Rabbit, I would like to see more of it. But again, I love the premise. I love that this kid who's being swept up in Nazi Germany and he's he's you know in a brown shirt and he 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 has to you know like like the 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 Jewish girl says she's like you you want to belong to a, a club. And and the fact that why wouldn't why wouldn't a child have Adolf Hitler as an imaginary friend in Germany? When he's everywhere, he's on the radio. He's 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 the Führer, you know. Uh, I think Jojo Rabbit is going to be a very interesting movie. I can't wait to see. It looks fantastic to me, but I don't think that. Uh, again, I think you're going to be made to believe that this kid. I mean, Jojo Rabbit's heightened. The reality's heightened. It doesn't seem to me like there's a lot of within the, the the they're not too concerned i mean yeah it's not subtitled the kids are speaking with english accents i buy into all of that but it seems to me that jojo rabbit is creating its own world and within that world it creates its own rules and that's what all great fantasy films do 
And even though there's a strong dollop of reality in what uh, appears to be a strong, strong dollop of, uh, of reality in Jojo Rabbit, it looks like it does a good job of setting up its rules, setting up its universe, and acting on it. And at least in this new trailer that dropped today, I think it looks like a wonderful movie. Gabriel Reed is here again. He says, uh, by the way, thanks for supporting the channel, sir. Just bought a 4K Iron Man Steelbook, First Blood, Stand By Me, Braveheart, and Unforgiven, all in 4K. Um, my God, you know, I, I can speak to uh, Unforgiven, Stand By Me, and Braveheart. They all look wonderful in 4K. I have not seen First Blood in 4K, but I need to get First Blood in 4K. But yes, good on you, sir. Support physical media, damn it. Uh, Willow Yang is here. Hello, Willow. I'm going to read your letter about Star Trek The Next Generation. Boy, was I excited to get it. Willow Yang says, have you wondered how life... Uh, <laughs> have you wondered how life in the reverse universe in the counterclock incident works? How are people born? How do they reproduce? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> what Willow is asking about is the, all, the, the final episode of Star Trek The Animated Series... Episode 22 is, I believe it's episode 22. I think it's the last episode. I'm pretty sure. The counterclock incident, episode 22. In it, everything runs backwards. Kind of like Benjamin Button, the movie Benjamin Button, if you saw that, Fincher's movie. And I think Willow, again, speaking from a scientific perspective, from a storytelling sense and watching a 22-minute ep episode of an animated show, you can sit there and buy into the fact that people age backwards. But have you, have you wondered how life in the reverse universe works? How are people born? How do they reproduce? Well, at some point, you know, the idea that everything goes backwards couldn't be the case, can it? Like, it would be really interesting. Like, do you give birth to your uh, a, a fully grown, decrepitly old human? Uh, I don't. I don't. I mean, but now that you, I, I mean, I have, but. It's interesting, whenever somebody tells a story like that, they don't get into the actual details of it all. And I think it breaks down. I think it works when you're watching a short story like that and you can contemplate it. But when you actually think about the scientific reality, Willow, and it's exactly what I was saying, the scientific reality of you trying to grapple with the counterclock universe, it doesn't make any sense at all. Because <laughs> it wasn't thought through. It's an interesting premise that they went with and told the story because... You know, it was all about aging and life and mortality and all of that. And they chose to show it in the framework that a kid could grasp because a kid's not going to be like, you know, I didn't when I was a kid. I'm like, no, wait a minute. You know, how, how do we age backwards? Like, how are you born? I don't know how that works. But it's a very good question. I, I have wondered that, but I've also, it's also frustrating because uh, wondering leads you nowhere. You can't even extrapolate <laughs> what might be happening. You just never know. Stubble McShave says, for every fantastical element in a scene, you need three or four concrete elements from reality to make it believable. Otherwise, it becomes unreal and arbitrary. Couldn't agree with you more, Stubble. I think that's the key to great fantasy writing. Um, again, you get asks. But again, it's got to be more than three or four concrete elements per scene. You need concrete reality. You need rules to ground whatever fantasy world that you're in. I mean, one of the great things about Dune is that for the Fremen and the sandworms and all that and the lack of water on, on Arrakis, the idea that the Fremen have still suits, that still suits recycle every single part of your body, whether it's your urine, your feces, your sweat, all of it is recycled because that's the only way you could survive out on the desert. Now, is a still suit, I don't know how, who designed a still suit? I mean, I don't remember. Maybe it's in a book. I'm sure they got into that. But the actual science behind a still suit, I don't know how it works. But they gave me enough that I do believe in it. So I'm like, okay. Then you've solved a problem. How does an entire, well, I, call, I guess call them a race. Let's call the Fremen a race. Indi are they indigenous to Arrakis? Or do they become they become part of the Fremen, you know, as, as people that have left, whether it's the Harkonnens or the Atreides or whoever the hell was managing Arrakis for for the lands rad, whatever, um, you believe in it. Suddenly this question of how do people survive in a desert for any length of time? Ah, a still suit. So Frank Herbert gives you enough that you, now I believe that. I believe a humanoid life form can survive in the desert with a properly uh, uh, attired in a still suit, in a Fremen made still suit. I believe it. 
that's what it gave me. That that becomes those details that you're like, I don't know how exactly how it works, but they've given me enough to believe that I, I'm like, okay, I don't need to know exactly how feces are extracted from your body or you just let go and then they're taken apart by what mechanism and recycled into food or something. I don't know. I just know that they paid lip service to it. There you go. Uh, <laughs> Chuck Philpot, send me a very generous super chat. Thank you, Chuck. And you say... RMB, the master of fun and wonder. I even like that because sanctimonious, um, you know, the sanctimoniously notorious is just me saying something that I don't even know what that means. But the fact that somebody else called me a master, that John Campia called me a master of fun and wonder, I'd like that. I mean, you know what? If there's an official, whoever the next president of the United States is, I would like to throw in the towel to be part of your cabinet. I would like to be the master of fun and wonder. I think that would be. A good thing to be. Uh, another letter. Uh, I like this. There, there's a lot of really good letters that I have here. Now, this one, I'm going to get a little negative. I like this, though. Going to get a little negative. Uh, a lot of people have seen the new trailer for Terminator Dark Fate. Now, I'm a big Terminator fan. I saw Terminator in the theater in 84 when it first opened. I loved it. Loved it. I love Terminator 2. First hundred million dollar movie. It certainly was a marvel of visual effects and action technology and filmmaking. And there's a lot of verisimilitude in there. Maybe not so much anymore when you go back and you look at the T-1000 transforming. But it's okay from a long time ago. Technology has definitely increased. But I'm a Terminator fan. However, as more and more Terminators have, have, have come out, whether it's Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines, Terminator Salvation, Terminator Genesis, you know, whatever. A lot of Terminator movies. They've only got this central premise. <laughs> the central premise is Skynet basically needs to go back in time. And, of course, the Sarah Connor Chronicles, a TV series. And human beings will eventually defeat it. And Skynet has to get rid of all the pesky humans to continue on. Simple premise. I get it. But the more you delve into that universe, the more questions arise. Why did these machines need to get rid of humanity? Why couldn't they coexist? You know, isn't there easier ways to do things? Why do the machines not send back Terminators to, I don't know, like Q, the moment of life beginning on Earth? You know, single cell and, uh, organisms. Why do you go back to kill the resistance leader? Why don't you go back to kill the resistance leader's grandparents? There's a lot of things that break down uh, on the subatomic level uh, if you're going to talk about the storyline behind Terminator. The original Terminator was relentless. You don't question that because in the back of your mind, it's like maybe that's the only place the Terminators could go to. But in a world where we have all kinds of time travel happening and the grandfather paradox being looked at from every perspective, it's a little hard to buy into the Terminator franchise telling the same story yet again. And here we go. Dan Vakura is here with a letter. Hey, Rob, the new Terminator Dark Fate trailer dropped, and it was much better than the first one. Here's the cold, hard truth about the film, which absolutely no one is talking about. It doesn't matter if it's good or not, because it's going to flop and be the last Terminator film for a long time. The budget is reportedly between $160 and $200 million, which doesn't include the marketing. It's also rated R. At minimum, to make a decent profit, if it is a $160 million budget, it needs to make $450 million worldwide. It will most likely need to make at least $500 million to justify getting a sequel. No Terminator film has done that since Terminator 2 Judgment Day, which would be much more nowadays with inflation. If it is between 180 and 200 million for the budget, then it probably will need, need to make close to 550 million. That isn't going to happen with that first trailer giving off a poor first impression along with its rating. David Ellison funded an R rated movie between 160 million and 200 million is the worst investment of the year. It just can't be justified with the box office needed to make a profit. I know that James Cameron wants it to start a new trilogy, which he reiterated again to deadline within the last week. He then said, if we get fortunate enough to make some money with Dark Fate, we know exactly where we can go with the subsequent films. Sorry, James Cameron, that simply isn't happening. Terminator Salvation and Terminator Genesis were both supposed to start trilogies where Genesis was even supposed to have a spin-off TV show. It obviously didn't work out for either one. I'm not sure if Dark Fate will even make $440 million like Genesis, which means that Dark Fate could lose money or barely make any at that spot. The movie has also tested poorly at early screenings where I know people who have seen it. I've read one positive reaction to Dark Fate from an early screening, which is not good, with everyone else being negative on the movie. 
Everyone knows about when movies test poorly, like Dark Phoenix, and if Dark Fate was a superhero movie, then this would have been discussed already. This movie is simply not set up for success, and if the plan was always to have it be rated R, the budget should have been much lower. I think it should have been a $60 million max, and definitely under $100 million. Unfortunately, it wasn't, and it'll be the final nail in the coffin of the Terminator franchise for films where another one won't happen for a long time. I think that Terminator should just go back to television, and I've always wanted a continuation of the Sarah Connor Chronicles, but the damage will have been done. Hopefully I'm wrong, and Dark Fate is a much bigger success than expected, where the franchise can continue, but I'm not holding my breath. Dan V. Well, Dan, you know, to me, they've done a lot of Terminator. <laughs> Uh, Terminator 1, Terminator 2, as we talked about Terminator 3, Terminator Salvation, Terminator Genesis. And the problem is there's just not much more of a story to tell. The story is Skynet trying to defeat the humans who want to get Skynet bad for wipe, back for wiping out most of humanity. That's it. And, and also, the vision of a crazy AI, I mean, we're talking, it's, it's 35 years old this year. And even that version of a crazy AI was based on Outer Limits episodes from the 60s and a lot of science fiction that had happened since then. I think that, in a way, I guess I would call the concept behind Terminator quaint and archaic. I think what it has become is a framework to have great action scenes. And I think that maybe Dark Fate, I'm hoping that between Tim Miller and, and um, James Cameron, we're going to get a film worth seeing. But everything that I've seen in the trailers, for me, there's nothing intellectually compelling that's going to get me out of the theater and be like, or get me into the theater and say, oh my God, I got to see that. Because once again, it's the same thing. I mean, Mackenzie Davis is a human being enhanced with cybernetics. Okay. You know, I believe that. Sure. And this Terminator has now come back to kill a female leader of the resistance. Maybe. I mean, I just, I, what does Skynet care? Well, fine. Like, so Skynet is defeated. I mean, I, you know what I need to know? I need to know what Skynet wants. Is there something it wants to accomplish? I mean, I understand it becomes sentient. It wants to eradicate all human life for whatever reason it does. Human beings are dicks. They pollute the planet. Okay. But now Skynet has to want something. And I think if I knew that Skynet wanted something, like what does it hope to achieve? Does it hope to eventually create the technology and go off world and, and, and colonize the universe? Well, that would be interesting. And, and in doing so, maybe it resurrects humanity at some later date, like Proteus and Demon Seed. I don't know. And I think at the end of the day, the problem with the Terminator franchise is they've told every story they can tell within the framework of Terminator. And in the new Terminator, okay, there's a plane, there's planes crashing into each other, which, by the way, are clearly CG planes, so there's no verisimilitude. The one great thing about Terminator 2 is, is just the size of the action. You know, a semi-truck without trailer falls into the L.A. River to chase John Connor on a little motorcycle. I mean, that shit was real, yo. I mean, the T-1000 wasn't, but the action, I mean, it was so big. I mean, they were really blowing st stuff up. That's why... We were so into it. Maybe the Terminator franchise is by has passed its sell by date. I don't know. Um, it's an interesting question. An interesting question. Uh, speaking along those lines, here's another uh, another letter from Franz M. Franz M. I like this letter a lot that Franz has written. But first of all, let's see if anybody else uh, has anything to say. Uh, as far as this chat goes, we shall see. No, you're all good. So this letter comes from Franz M., who is talking about Stephen King. Now, I have to say before I read this letter, I love Stephen King. The first thing I read of Stephen King was Night Shift in the Stand. I'm a huge Stephen King fan all the way back to the 70s. And yes, I've got my first edition mass market copy of It in a bro dart. It's a mint condition. It's the same one I read in 1986. Uh, Rob, Andre Overdahl, the autopsy of Jane Doe and scary stories to tell in the dark, will apparently direct an adaptation of King's novel from a script written by James Vanderbilt, Zodiac, but given the resurgence of typically terrible, oh, wait a minute, I, I, you know, I don't know what, what you're saying. I think what you're talking about is the novel, The Long Walk. So for those of you who don't know, 
Stephen King, before he was outed, had written uh, novels under a pseudonym, Richard Bachman. He wrote Rage. He wrote um, uh, The Long Walk. He wrote Road Work. And he wrote The Running Man. Now, no one knew that he was outed. And when he wrote Thinner, which was released as a hardcover, it came out somehow. He, I forget exactly how he was outed, but he was outed. As and, and and I'll tell you something. In my junior high, The Long Walk was kind of a cult novel. I love The Long Walk. And the premise of The Long Walk, for those of you who haven't read it, it takes place in a slightly dystopian future in America. And every, I guess it's every year, as I remember it, every year they have what's called The Long Walk. And there are two people from every state. So there's 50 people uh, uh, times two. So you've got 100 people. And what happens is they just start walking. 100 people start walking. And if you drop below three miles an hour, you get a ticket. And if you get three tickets in an hour, you get shot in the head. And there is no stopping. You just walk 24 hours a day, 48 hours a day, 72 hours, whatever, two days. You just keep walking. And the long walk is over when there's one person left standing. Now, this book, and, and of course, the main Jim Garrity and there's a character named Stebbins and there's all kinds of stuff going on. And there's flashbacks to these kids lives and what drew them into the long walk and why are they there? And the winner gets whatever they want. And I love this book and, and it dealt with teenage angst and all that. And it was way before the hunger games and the long, uh, the running man, which is in the Richard Bachman, what Stephen King wrote later also kind of dealt with that same kind of thing. Uh, his book, Rage, that I would love to see made, is about a kid who brings a gun into his homeroom and holds his entire class hostage. That'll never get made, I don't think, because the first thing he does is shoots his teacher in the head. But uh, The Long Walk is a great book. Anyway, so what Franz M says, Andre Overdahl, The Autopsy of Jane Doe and Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, is going to direct an adaptation of The Long Walk. Will apparently direct an adaptation of King's novel for New Line from a script written by James Vanderbilt, Zodiac. But given the resurgence of typically terrible Stephen King's translations in Hollywood, should anyone give flying monkey shit? I liked the soulless by the numbers bastardization of Stephen King's Pet Cemetery in 2019 as a nice little horror film, but I simply cannot in good conscience recommend anyone but casual viewers and cheap thrill seekers spend hard-earned money to see it in theaters, not when a much better version of the same story already exists in the form of 1989's Pet Cemetery, a shockingly well-told and atmospheric masterpiece that rises above dated effects and genre cliches to deliver a resonant and heart-wrenching tale of family, death, and coping with loss. In the new version of Stephen King's It, I didn't like this iteration of Pennywise. He sounded like a fat white guy on the other end of a child's suicide helpline doing his best to imitate Michael Jackson's soft falsetto to put the kid at ease. In other words, he was fucking creepy. Let's be honest. Although we can all name a handful of undeniably stellar exceptions, The Green Mile and The Shining, None but the most dedicated, ridden cowboy with buns of steel could deny the undisputed reality that most Stephen King films are poorly made, misguided attempts which suck harder than they do. Nobody likes delusional fanboys. The Long Walk, for those fortunate enough not to have read it, is a trek into the psychological terror of an all-too-real dystopian present, present where we, the constant readers, see the novel's titular murderous game play out to its deadly conclusion and the downward spiral into depression and then madness participating in such depravity brings. This novel ranks among the most ex exhausting of Stephen King's works of art, uh, affecting our brains like an overdose of a pleasant drug, luring us in with its dreamlike philosophic existentialism and then hitting us with a bullet of dark depression and actual physical pain so intense so real that we never want to enjoy the activity ever again. I still want a long walk movie, but can they even make a movie where like a hundred kids get shot in the head? Franz M. Well, first of all, uh, Stephen King has definitely, he has a long tradition all the way back to Carrie. I think Carrie was 76. Brian De Palma's Carrie, I believe was the first King adaptation, which by the way, a terrific film, great adaptation of, of the book, which has obviously also been remade. I think there's been very some very fine Stephen King adaptations. King didn't like Kubrick's The Shining, but 
uh, let's just say the book sh suggested Kubrick's film. Um, the Dead Zone, I think, is a fine adaptation of King. Christine is a fine adaptation of King. I think my favorite Stephen King adaptations are probably The Shawshank Redemption and Stand By Me. But there have been so many different King adaptations, uh, whether it's Under the Dome, whether it's The Langoliers, The Stand. I mean, you name it. Most Stephen King books have been adapted. Dolores Claiborne, I think, is a very good Stephen King adaptation. Rob Reiner's Misery is a great Stephen King adaptation. I think, I think the the real um, the real shortcoming when Stephen King adaptations <coughs> fall short. I like Darabont's The Mist, even though I didn't like how they changed the end is that human beings are always at front, the front and center of Stephen King's stories. Of course, there's always the supernatural and the creatures and the horrors and the terrors and all of those things. But at the end, at the end of the day, Stephen King books are always about people and his richly developed characters. And those characters are human beings. Those characters are people. And and I think that that his rich characters, we all recognize ourselves, and that's why his books are so good. I mean, I you know one of his books that I've quite enjoyed lately was a book called Revival, which I thought was pretty good. I I buy every Stephen King book that comes out. Um, I'm really looking forward to his new book, The Institute, uh, that comes out next week. I think it comes out next week, and I, I pretty much tear through Stephen King books, but I think. The, the people that make the movies forget that you you need to strip away all the supernatural and the craziness that happens and make make the great stories about people. I mean, I, I'd forgotten watching Stand By Me. I guess I didn't forget, but that's an 85-minute movie where not a moment is wasted. What an incredible film Stand By Me is. And it's about those kids, man. Um, you know, I, I liked it. I didn't love it. I'm going to see it part two this weekend. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing it. I guess, um, I don't know why I don't like it as much. I want to like it. I didn't even like the novel. I, I mean, the novel's big and epic and sprawling, but I just think it was a little, I don't know. But uh, I'm a big King fan. I'd love to see The Long Walk get made. Um, yeah. Hopefully it's good. I hope it's good. Uh, the Long Walk, I don't know how they're going to make that movie, to be honest. I, and, and, and in this day and age, a movie where literally a hundred kids march to their deaths and get shot in the head. I think the first thing they're going to do is probably make people, the kids are just going to get exhausted. <laughs> no one's going to get shot in the head. You have to walk. I, I, although I don't know, once you stop walking, what is the alternative? I'm sure the first studio mandate to the, the script would be, well, we have to figure out a way where the uh, government isn't shooting these kids in the head, even though that's a vital part of the story. We shall see. I I I don't know, but um, you know, I would I would I would I I hope it's good because I love that book and I, that would be. I know that Richard Kelly, who made Donnie Darko and Southland Tales, talked for a long time about adapting it, and I think Frank Darabont actually owned the rights to the Long Walk for a long time. Maybe he'll wind up as a producer. Uh, I'm 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 not sure. Um, you know, who knows? Good question, though. Good question let's see if anybody has sent in any questions themselves i don't know we shall see um uh oh something something went wrong see my, i'm getting all kinds of computer interference yes uh wade o'neill sent in a question speaking of ai i quite enjoyed spader as ultron and hope the character returns how would ultron react to stark being gone you know what if they did bring ultron back i could see stark or i could see ultron sad about it i think ultron's pretty smart i mean ultron it's interesting ultron could be a great antagonist to bring back certainly you know in the comics ultron has come back how many times many different incarnations i always love ultron i love of course james spader i would love to see ultron come back i love my ultron hot toy that's right here i'm a huge fan uh, and I love, you know, AI's running amok as long as we've seen them so often, they've got to bring back a new twist. You know, maybe, maybe Ultron has figured out a way to make himself biological. I don't know. 
I don't know. Uh, you know what? I'm going to read Willow Yang's letter because Willow Yang, as we know, has written in a lot about her journey through Star Trek, the original series, and now she's into the next generation. Although, is the next generation into Willow? Has it permeated her consciousness? We don't know. We're going to find out. This is from Willow Yang, ladies and gentlemen. Willow Yang. Greetings, Rob. I'm sending my long overdue report on Star Trek The Next Generation. While I have, as of today, August 31st, already finished the first two seasons, my discussion here will primarily focus on the pilot encounter at Farpoint and my initial impressions of the series. I will first talk about the main cast, starting with the arguably most important and iconic character, Captain Jean-Luc Picard, played, of course, by the great Patrick, Sir Patrick Stewart, Having already heard so much about Patrick going into the series, my expectations for him were sky high, and hence I was somewhat taken aback to discover that he was a bit of a crank in the pilot. He seemed quite crotchety and short-tempered and didn't come off as particularly personable, although he does greatly improve in subsequent episodes. However, in spite of my initial hesitance on his personality, I really appreciated the performance that Stewart gave. You are free to disagree with me on this, but I preferred Stewart's acting to that of William Shatner's. No, I understand. Shatner is incredibly charismatic. However, whenever he needed to get emotional or deliver a rousing speech, I find that he tends to get a little hammy. Even though Picard often gets irritated, he does a fair amount of shouting. Stewart is always able to rein it in. I never thought that he went overboard. The original series was groundbreaking for featuring female characters in esteemed positions, and the next generation has certainly made further strides in that area. In the pilot, we're introduced to characters like Tasha Yar serving as the Enterprise Chief of Security and Deanna Troy acting as Picard's key advisor. We have women like Beverly Crusher and in the second season, Catherine Pulaski, played again by, by Diana Muldar, serving as the Chief Medical Officer. And I find it refreshing that actresses brought on are actually old enough to look believable as qualified doctors. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that skirts are apparently now unisex. That would be a scant it's called a scant. It is the 24th century after all, and men have every right to look good and feel great. <laughs> Although I'm not thrilled with the way that some of the female characters have been written, I'm still impressed by the next generation's inclusion of women in roles that have been traditionally reserved for men. As for the remaining crew members, I did initially find Riker to be a bit bland in the pilot, although he has grown considerably on me in subsequent episodes and is now one of my favorite characters. I love Data from the get-go, even though he superficially appears like a successor to Spock. He is considerably much more humorous and approachable, eagerly partaking in activities that Spock would probably find to be illogical. I also quite like LaForge. The camaraderie he has with the other characters is always a joy to watch. I would have liked to see if I would like to have seen more done with Worf. Oh, just you wait. The Klingons were always adversaries in the original series, so it was quite a pleasant surprise to see one working with the mostly human crew in the next generation. Unfortunately, Worf is usually sidelined and seems to get frequently pummeled in fights, although I do hear he receives a more prominent role in later seasons. The one and only character that I really can't stand is Wesley. I don't like using the term Mary Sue too liberally, but that is just the description that comes to my mind when I think of him. This is no knock on Will Wheaton, whom I'm sure did the best job that he could, but I'm unable to buy into Wesley being the gifted prodigy who seems to be always able to come up with a solution and save the day. I'm hard-pressed to find anything compelling or likable about his character, and it is agonizing for me to see him receiving more prominent roles in later episodes. The only solace I can take is that Picard shares in my distaste for him. It does bring me a certain amount of satisfaction to hear him yelling at Wesley. Aesthetically, the special effects and set designs in Next Generation do look markedly sleeker and more digital and futuristic in comparison to its predecessor. The new bridge did take me a while to get used to. The bridge on the original Enterprise looked much more like a cockpit, being compact with display panels and control boards everywhere. The bridge on the new Enterprise is much more spacious, with only the front and back parts being delegated to controls. I actually thought that it resembled a living room. I was also a bit baffled by the fact that the Enterprise apparently now carries families on board, considering the mortality rate of crew members in the original series. 
I'm not sure if it's a good idea to bring untrained personnel and children on expeditions. Sure, they have the option of the saucer separation, as was first demonstrated in the pilot, but that to me just solidifies the notion that the Enterprise missions are perilous. Heck, Picard almost destroyed the entire ship after being threatened by Nagilim and where science has lease, where silence has lease. We see the obliteration of the Yamato and everyone on board in contagion. Is it even ethical to bring miners along? Another notable character that encountered Farpoint introduced is Q, who served as the episode's antagonist and is apparently a recurring adversary throughout the series. I know this is probably an unpopular opinion, but I have to be honest, I didn't care for him at all in the pilot. I hated Trelane from the Squire of Gothos. The character just had a knack for getting on my nerves. I spent the entire episode wanting to punch him in his smug, smirking face, which is, of course, a bad idea, seeing that he has godlike superpowers. Thus, I was less than thrilled by Q, who seemed to be heavily inspired by Trelane and was just as obnoxious as the latter was with a holier-than-thou attitude. It was infuriating to watch him strutting about in his gaudy costumes, taunting Picard and his crew, with whom he had put on trial for humanity's past sins. I also found his test with the giant space jellyfish to be overly didactic. Q's attempts of tempting the crew into using violence came off as quite heavy-handed and a little cheesy. Reflecting back on the episode, however, I do wonder what a trial for our species would be like. Q might be condescending and smug, but he wasn't wrong in pointing out humanity's abhorrent history, and it isn't just the multitudes of atrocities we've inflicted on each other that we need to answer for. It is also what we have done to our planet and its other inhabitants. It is also for the pollution of the environment, the depletion of the ozone layer, the melting of the ice caps, the destruction of the rainforests and the Great Barrier Reefs. It's also for the dodos, the passenger pigeons, the Tasmanian tigers, the golden toad, the western black rhinos, and the countless other species we have driven to extinction. When we stand trial, how would a jury find us? It is something that is probably worth considering going forward. Yours sincerely, Willow. Well, Willow, uh, I really appreciate the fact that you take the good with the bad with Next Generation. Um, I think you will discover as you move forward, especially into season three, the show becomes markedly different. You know, I think one of the things, having spent three years of my life documenting the making of that show and literally virtually talking to everyone involved, from the writing staff to all the major actors, what was very interesting about Star Trek is this idea that they were trying to capture something, uh, lightning in a bottle. And remember, Star Trek was never particularly successful when it was originally on, and then it became legendary in syndication, and as the years went by, and, and Roddenberry, I think, really had something to prove. And when it first started out, I think they were trying to recapture something, uh, a formula maybe, and they tried to do something different. I think one of the smartest things they ever did was move the series so far into the future. I think that was a great idea, 100 years in the future. They weren't even allowed to mention any of the characters' names until the third season. I'm not going to say, you know what, I could tell you who, but it's interesting. You, you'll get to be surprised when you come to that episode. I mean, it's funny, even though people talk about spoilers and things like that, and I, I talk a lot about spoilers for movies that are really old, but if there's ever an opportunity where you don't have to spoil something for somebody, especially knowing you just started watching Next Generation and all of it can be new, look, you could go online and at a couple of keystrokes, you can find out anything you want about Star Trek The Next Generation, but it's more interesting that you go into it not knowing anything and you discover it like it's brand new, and I think that's true of anything. There's so much stuff out there. Like, look, when I finally watched Breaking Bad, it was what, during the second season of Better Call Saul? I had never seen Breaking Bad. I had heard, of course, about I Keep Up With My Pop Culture, but I had forgotten, you know, Ozymandias. Yeah, I had forgotten about Gus Fring. I, things, I didn't know everything that was going on. And the experience of watching every hour of TV is very different than knowing what happens, just like a movie. I can read a movie review. I've never, ever, 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 ever in my life read a movie review or have somebody tell me about a movie and have it at all resemble what the experience is for me actually sitting down and watching a TV show or watching a movie. The actual experience, everything I look at from the music cues to the editing to the colors to the costumes, I mean all of it, no one has ever conveyed to me what the experience of watching a movie is like by telling me about it. I love to read reviews. They never ruin the experience of seeing a movie for me. They really don't even when I know 
a big element that might be spoiled from a story standpoint because I'm always spoiling movies for myself as I, in my own mind, guess the plot. I wonder, is that going to happen? Oh, I anticipate that's happening. Oh, when it happens, does it bother me? No. If it's done well, it certainly doesn't. So one never knows. Um, I, I, uh, I'm just really excited to see what you think moving forward. What do you think moving forward? Now, uh, <laughs> here's a letter I really enjoyed. It calls, it, it calls, it comes from, well, hang on, before I read it, <laughs> this is, this, uh, it's a Star Wars letter. You know, I can't, I can't not have a Star Wars letter. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, John Suntress of, of the Word Balloon Podcast. And if you haven't listened to the Word Balloon Podcast, one of the great pop culture podcasts of all time, especially if you love comic books, John Suntress of the Word Balloon Podcast asks, are you a Justice Society fan? Favorite Justice Society of America stories? You know, I am. And I've read like the whole Jeff Johns run. I mean, I have, I have what, three Justice League uh, of Justice Society omnibuses. You know, I always, whenever somebody says Justice Society, it's like a Pavlovian response. I go back to my, when I was a kid, my favorite thing in the world was when the Justice Society of America once a year teamed up with the JLA. And my favorite story of all was when the crime syndicate was introduced. And I keep saying it was in giant size uh, Justice League 114, which it was a hundred page issue and it was a reprint. And I had never encountered those stories when they were new. And that that is my favorite Justice Society of America story. But I know what you mean. I'd have to go back and research. It's all sort of a blur to me. But I would I would have to. I, I, but I'll can I get back to you on that? A Justice Society of America story. Um. Oh, Will Yang says, "Do you have any phobias other than the thought police coming to take you away for enjoying a Clockwork Orange?" I I I don't. I don't have any phobias. I mean, I do have physical revulsions to things like I, I have to stop myself. I have spiders. They're not, I'm not phobic, though. I mean, when I see a spider, I, I'll jump back, but I, I do find them fascinating. Living in Australia, there's nothing like seeing your first huntsman spider if you're somebody who's scared of, um, of, uh, of spiders. Let me tell you that. Ooh. No, I don't really have any phobias. Um, there are things that I can be scared of at the time, but I, I, I'll take a deep breath and, and calm down. But yeah, I don't, I don't have any phobias really. That's interesting. I don't, but yes, I, I am terrified of civilization collapsing and, and the lack of civility and, you know, being captured by a band of ruffians who, who see no value in my life and they slowly torture me to death and, 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 uh, then eventually chop my head off without giving me any, kind of ability to defend myself. I mean, that's pretty much my, but that's a fear as opposed to a phobia. I don't really have phobias, um, at least not yet. Maybe I'll encounter one later in life. Dan V900 is here. Dan V900 says, Terminator Salvation, The Final Battle is a comic that delves into Skynet's motivations and ends in peace, but it's not that great. Tim Miller said during Comic-Con that it's Legion in Dark Fate not Skynet. Yeah, I mean, I hear that what they've done is they've figured out a, what I'm most interested in is if Skynet is there and it's not John Connor who's now the problem, it's it's that young girl. Sorry, I'm having a little... I, I know, people are going to be like, you know, Rob, you shouldn't drink diet soda. Probably shouldn't, but you know, I don't, don't drink that much of it. Um, uh, I, yeah, I'll be curious to see. But again, you know, what's interesting is I find that a lot of a lot of the licensed comics for Star Wars, for Terminator, for Predator, for Alien, a lot of these franchises, it has been the the spin-off stories or the comics, especially the comics when it comes to Predator. So there's something about comics that Terminator, Predator, Alien, they just lend themselves well to that medium. Uh, I feel like we've got a lot of much better Terminator stories in the comics and much better alien stories in the comics and certainly better predator stories in the comics. And that's not saying they're all great, but you know, but the idea that once again, there's a computer that's sending somebody back in time to kill their ancestor. Like, why do they have to, please tell me why do they have to go back and kill that particular person? Why not their grandparents? Why not go back? Why did the board go back to the time of first contact and first contact? What a convoluted, ridiculous thing to do. Why not just go, unless they needed 
they wanted to strip away technology so they could later assimilate the earth. I don't know, but just give that, give me something. Tell me something. I don't know. I don't know. This letter comes from Paul McGuera. <laughs> Paul McGuera. He doesn't like The Last Jedi. Hi, Rob. This is my third letter to you, and I appreciate your time in reading them and discussing the topics at hand. I'm writing to you this time to discuss what seems to be the theme of the week, Star Wars. I am a Star Wars The Last Jedi detractor, and I can't seem to like the movie no matter how hard I try. I tried to watch it again last week after swearing off of it as the worst Star Wars movie ever that fateful night when I went to the theater back in December of 2017. I thought it was the worst Star Wars movie ever made at that time, but I wanted to try to watch it again to see if my opinion had changed or at least mellowed. I can state that my opinion has changed. It has now fallen to being worse than the holiday special. Come on, dude. <laughs> yes, Rob, you heard me right. Worse than Lumpy and the Gang. I would rather watch the holiday special on a loop for a week on VHS than to subject myself to the torment of watching that monstrosity again. I know, Rob. You're maybe thinking I'm exaggerating. I am not. Out of the whole movie, there's only one scene that I like. The scene where Luke is watching the twin sons was great. His story arc is another matter entirely, and his complete character arc and his dying will surely go down as the worst decision ever made. Disney could have made a killing, pun intended, selling books about the continuing adventures of Luke after episode 9 if they would have left Luke alive. After nine, have Luke disappear into the unknown regions on new quests and write books about that. What a novel idea, don't you think? Ha 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 ha, I see what you did there. Yes, I've listened to your argument that we should take the positive from the movie and move on. Mind you, I'm old, and I did see the original Star Wars in the movie theater back in 77. And from there on, it was my favorite movie of all time. It uplifted my spirits, spirits in a basic way. It's a great space opera full of escapism at its finest. In my opinion, this new trilogy has no new story to tell. It is sure, certainly not escapism, just boring character arcs that go nowhere. I liked Rey in 7. Her character arc in 8 went nowhere. At the beginning of 8, Kylo was a whiny little emo bitch, and at the end, he is the same. No character development there either. I could go on and on, but by now, everyone knows these things on one side and the other has explanations made up in their mind. I could go on and on, but by now, everyone knows these things on one side and the other side, has explanations made up in their minds to defend these choices by Ryan Johnson. Verisimilitude, your catchword, if you will, was nowhere to be found to me. Luke's character arc was pathetic and has been done a million times before. Who hasn't seen that old gunslinger that swears off using a gun only to use it at the last moment to save the day? Who hasn't seen the disillusioned samurai that renounces his blade only to pick it up again to save his family or child? Like I said, Luke's story arc has been done a million times before, but just because it hasn't been done in Star Wars doesn't make it new. The real tragedy is, is that I'm not angry or disillusioned. I have apathy for this whole new sequel trilogy, and that's worse. I could care less for something that has brought me so much joy over the years. Of course, this could all change when Episode Nine comes out, but for now, I hold no hope for the Disney Star Wars stories. Even if Nine is the best thing since sliced bread, the sequel trilogy will forever be the worst of the three trilogies. These new stories feel small and weak with no direction. So many great stories to choose from in the Legends books, and they come up with this crap. Don't get me wrong, some of the Legends stuff is crap also. I respect my fellow fans who love Star Wars The Last Jedi. I'm happy for the ones that can enjoy these new films, and I'm sorry I'm not one of them. A lot of the backlash these films could have been avoided, I've given some thought about why so much anger by some of my fellow Last Jedi detractors. I think it's because they want to be heard. If Disney would have come out with a statement like, we support Ryan Johnson's vision of the film, but understand that some fans' expectations and enjoyment were not met, we will always strive to make the best and most entertaining film possible for all of our Star Wars fans, or something to that effect. I bet there wouldn't be half the backlash there is now. Fans just want to be heard. And that is also why your channel and others are so successful nowadays. You give a platform for the fans to be heard. Hopefully episode nine is great so I can burn that holiday special VHS. <laughs> Take care, Rob, and keep up the great work. And those Lucky Tiger products really are good. Paul M. Well, Paul M., first of all, thanks for buying some Lucky Tiger products. You know, to be honest, if I didn't like Lucky Tiger products, I wouldn't allow them to sponsor this channel. I really do like Lucky Tiger products as well. Uh, uh, I really do. I think they're great. So thanks for that. But okay, this letter 
first of all, I appreciated your letter. It didn't have a lot of screaming vitriol, and and uh, I, I think your points are well made. Uh, you know, I think I think what's really interesting is that Star Wars, the first Star Wars, by definition, has a very simple, easy to understand story. It uses myths, it uses archetypes, but it it really tells a very simple, straightforward story, and its narrative thrust is very simple. It's it's not too convoluted. Look, you follow those Death Star plans all the way through the whole movie. You're following the Death Star plans. It's very simple. You're there the whole time. You understand exactly what's going on and all of the added detail about the Clone Wars and Darth Vader's past as Luke's father, even though you don't know it yet, and Ben Kenobi. You fought with my father in the Clone Wars? You get a lot of all of these, 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 all of this past, but all of it's just added detail. What you're doing is you're following the journey of the Death Star plans. Are the rebels going to be able to destroy the Death Star? And you watch all these people converging on Yavin. They're all going to the, you know, to the same point. They think they're going to Alderaan, then there's no Alderaan, then they get sidetracked by getting brought onto the Death Star, but they find the princess. They still need to get the plans to the rebels. It's a very simple narrative. And I think one of the interesting things about you know, everyone talks about how Last Jedi, I mean, uh, The Force Awakens, The Force Awakens made the biggest mistake of all when it emulated A New Hope. There's no simple There's no simple story. I mean, ideally, if you were going to tell that story about where is Luke Skywalker, the whole movie would have been about the journey of finding Luke Skywalker. You know, when Poe is visiting Laura Santeca at the beginning of the movie, if you wanted to really emulate Star Wars, shouldn't Poe have been Princess Leia? And, and follow that narrative arc in that direction, then Ray becomes Luke. And it just, they forgot that Star Wars is a simple story that uses myth and archetype. And I think that, like you said, with The Last Jedi, and, and let's face it, we had two trilogies. There's two Star Wars trilogies. And they the fact that they didn't map out a trilogy, like everybody didn't know, like, here are the stories, here we break it out, and let's do it. You know, you watch something like The Dark Crystal. One of the things I marvel about about The Dark Crystal is it is incredibly well thought out. The new Dark Crystal is layered and meaningful and, and has a lot going on, but it's still a, a very easy to understand story, but it has such depth and it's so adult, even though it's puppets. Um, you'd expect that that's what you would have received from the new Star Wars trilogy. But I think the real frustration with the Star Wars trilogy is it hasn't told the story that people are interested in hearing. That I, I think that's the greatest sin so far of both movies in the trilogy. There isn't a story being told yet that anybody has any interest in. Where is the narrative thrust? I mean, I, I, I'm not going to criticize The Last Jedi or, or The Force Awakens. The Last Jedi and Force Awakens, I think ultimately, sadly, are, are the result of Disney's uh, expenditure. And I think the Star Wars that we're going to get going forward, I'm hoping, at least beginning with The Mandalorian, is going to bring people's love for the Star Wars universe back. It's unfortunate because Han Solo, Princess Leia, Luke Skywalker, R2, and 3PO have certainly not had very satisfying conclusions, which seems odd considering that's what Star Wars really is. You know, at least when Paramount decided to reboot Star Trek, they're like, okay, we're, we're going to make a movie about Kirk, Spock, McCoy, Chekhov, Uhura, Scotty, Sulu. You know, they didn't... They, I would have thought, well, we don't have to reboot Star, Star Wars, but we need to make a story about Han Solo, Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia, R2-3PO, maybe Lando, Chewie, whatever. They didn't do that. They broke up all these people, and they gave us these new characters, and we're really waiting to see what happened to our... I mean, that's the real... That's... That's the real thing about Star Wars is like you made a Star Wars movie with all of our classic characters and didn't give them a story. I think that's the greatest. Ultimately, when you break it down, that's the ultimate sin and the ultimate frustration. I'm a lifelong Star Wars fan, and that was my frustration. I'm like, I don't care about any of these people. Don't give me pseudo Luke when you've got Luke. Don't give me pseudo Poe when you've got Harrison Ford. You've got Han Solo. Don't give me Kylo Ren, you know, don't you you haven't when you can do something else. The first order, why, why you can do anything that you 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 basically recreated the empire that's already been defeated. I mean, it's such a weird it, it was just a bizarre it, it, I mean, I don't want to get into it, but I I I don't disagree with you. 
And and even from your letter, hope springs eternal. You hope Rise of Skywalker is good, just like I do. I hope it's good. But at the end of the day, this story that is being told, or what I would characterize as a non-story, can people like these stories? Sure. There's no reason why you can't. But I think that anybody who is an astute follower of stories, it depends how, again, how deep you want to get into it. You know, if you just want to enjoy a movie for, for its own sake and like, oh, that was fun. You know, it was like Star Wars. It had X-Wings and lightsabers and she's going to train as a new Jedi and all this stuff. But we've had time to contemplate all these things. And there, in my mind, there wasn't, there's no storytelling verisimilitude. Also, you know, my whole thing, I just don't believe, Ray, you can talk to me until you're blue in the face. I will never believe, you can never convince me that Ray could pilot the Millennium Falcon like she does when it first takes off. There's nothing, there's nothing, I don't care if people are like, well, what is she strong with the Force? What does that mean? <laughs> the Force doesn't mean that you're, you, you can pilot a ship that is, it, it, by the way, the, the physics even. <laughs> you know, you've never seen the Millennium Falcon other than in, in the asteroid field in, in uh, Empire Strikes Back. They're always one step away. There's even moments when you even see 3PO as an audience proxy goes, whoa! Like you don't, you believe that the Millennium Falcon is one step away from being destroyed. And that's in an asteroid field. And I, I just, I think that the new, for me, the new Star Wars trilogy is a bunch of scenes I don't believe in. But that doesn't mean they can't bring me back. I just don't think that J.J. Abrams as a filmmaker understands how to create verisimilitude. I haven't seen it in any of his work. Um, and I, I, as a filmmaker and as a storyteller, somebody who's writing and directing his own material, uh, I don't think he understands how to do that. And it, 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 there's just little tweaks here and there. But, you know, uh, I don't think it's worse than the holiday special, though. The holiday special is atrociously awful. And it is incredibly difficult to sit through. Uh, all the, the weird grandpa watching the bizarre orgasmatron videos. Just a bunch of weird stuff, man. I can't go with you there. But I appreciate your letter. I like the tone of it. And, you know, I think the the one thing, I here's the one thing I will say about fandom and people who go on and on and on about The Last Jedi. And even when I go on and on and on about my hatred of Star Trek 09 or the last 10 years of Star Trek, it's not so much hatred as it is frustration. And it's frustration because... We all know what great Star Trek and Star Wars is because we've watched it. We can go, that's great Star Wars. And I think it's not asking a lot. And by the way, I've read great Star Trek comics and Star Wars comics and Star Wars novels and Star Wars Trek novels. And we have been, we've seen great Star Wars stories. Hell, I mean, The Force Unleashed told a great Star Wars story. I, I, I mean, Shadows of the Empire might not have been the greatest story in the world, but it was interesting. I'm like, oh, I'll follow that narrative. I'll, I'll play that, that the game. I'll play the video game and I'll read the book and, you know, I'll get the characters. And, and, and I think the frustration is that's what we expect. We expect the people that are making the movies to at least be aware enough of all of these other Star Wars stories and all of these different mediums, what works and what doesn't. And I think the frustration is when we see these things and we're like, that's what you chose to give us? Like, really? Like, why don't you, why don't you like find people? If I was going to make a Star Wars movie, why not go talk to Dave Filoni and just sit down and shoot the shit with him? Talk to George Lucas, like sit down and talk about this stuff and, and talk to people that are steeped in it. We certainly have that. Go watch a few online videos. It's, it's hard when you watch these franchises that have been around for so many years and you see the new iterations of them, uh, not, not nearly as effective as like your favorite comic book series why is dark empire a much better story than what we've been given in this trilogy uh and then of course then you'll see elements of it i'm sure in these various iterations i think that's the most frustrating thing so it's not that we're just we're all frustrated and i get it you know i guess the equivalent would be you you why well, I'm, I'm not going to say what i was going to say <laughs> it's just frustrating and, and the funny thing is, is everybody wants Star Wars to be great. Of all the stuff that we have in our world, I mean, if, if there's one thing we can all agree on for the most part, everybody loves Star Wars. You love kids love Star Wars. Parents love Star Wars. We want to love Star Wars. I mean, we, you've got the benefit of the doubt, you know? 
Star Wars is an easy lay. And yet, it's disappointing. Uh, John Suntress says, do you remember the TV movie Legend of the Golden Gun? A fun Star Wars ripoff portrayed as a full-fledged Western with Hal Holbrook as Obi-Wan. No, I don't. I've never seen The Legend of the Golden Gun, but it makes me want to go see it. Is it on YouTube? Oh, this is going to be my new obsession, ladies and gentlemen. The Legend of the Golden Gun. Advanced Junior says, Rob, earlier you said Rogue One could have been genius on the John Campia show. What do you mean? Well, I really liked Rogue One, but I found it, I would give it a, you know what? If I were, were to equate Rogue One to a James Bond movie, I would equate it to Goldeneye. I thought Goldeneye was pretty good. Really enjoyed it seeing a new Bond. You know, it told a pretty good story. I really, I enjoyed everything. I, it was, but it wasn't, it wasn't top tier Bond. It was good. I liked all the characters. I felt that we didn't get to know these characters enough. I would really have liked to see, and I keep going back to like Sorcerer. Sorcerer is a men on a mission movie. I would have liked to have spent five or 10 minutes with all of our disparate characters learning something about their lives and who they were. Like, you know, when the Imperials come in to get the Kyber crystals or whatever, and we got to see our two characters who were guarding those crystals and, and seeing those things happen, seeing those vignettes and leading into that storyline. I mean, we saw Jen Erso's storyline and her father, and I get it. That was that was the way to start a film. But I, I I think it could have delved more into those characters. And I thought that the plot machinations, like once you're there, oh, you've got to go see your father and all of these things, and uh, were not up to the kind of storytelling that I would have expected from this kind of film. I mean, it was trying to do a lot, admittedly. But I also feel... Uh, the thing that really bothered me the most is the end of the film. Love the last battle. I thought the battle was really great. The effects are great. Everything that was, I, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, Scarf, I, I loved all of that stuff. I thought it was great. Once they got a great climax, as far as men on mission movies go and women on mission movies, people, aliens, gentle beings on a mission movie. Uh, I think Rogue One kind of was on an arc. It was a great arc. But I'll tell you what I really didn't like about Rogue One the most. I didn't feel that it tied into Star Wars. It all leads up to we, we're seeing the blockade runner take off. I did not believe that we would assume that the end of at the end of Star Wars picks up pretty soon after Rogue One ends. I don't think they did a very good job of tying it all together. That might seem strange, but I just don't think they did. I didn't believe it. I didn't believe that 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 situation. I mean, I know they had to end it that way, and they had to. I don't think it was very well thought out. You know, if that makes if that makes any sense. I know it's kind of a weird thing. I just I didn't believe it. It seemed too different. It's like they didn't go look at Star Wars and said, "Okay, if this is how." Most of all, why the hell is that blockade runner going to Tatooine? There is never any mention really made, or maybe I forgot it. Somebody can pillory me, pillory me the pillory me on the internet about this, but. Why the hell are they going to get Obi-Wan Kenobi? Why? They could get him at any time. <laughs> you know, why, why him? Why don't they just go somewhere and, and, and in the middle of unknown space? I mean, it is hyperspace after all, or whatever. I just, it didn't make any sense to me. And it still doesn't. I've watched Rogue One like four or five or six times. I'm like, why are they going to Tatooine? I mean, certainly. If you're being chased by a Star Destroyer after a major battle, why are you heading to anyone of any tactical importance? Why aren't you going out? I mean, all they need to do is beam that information back to the rebels. You'd think that they'd be like they'd have some kind of commission, uh, transmitter or something. All they need to do is beam that information that they have to the rebel base. Why do they have to go to Tatooine? Just send it out. Just beam it out unless they're getting jammed or something. That's what I thought stopped it from being genius, Advanced Junior. Uh, I think that you're you're not, you know, I like Rogue One, but uh, to me, it's golden eye level. It's good. It's not great. Um, uh, Vegetable Tube says, you read Empire Strikes Back before seeing the movie. What was the cover art on the book? It was the movie poster. It was the Gone with the Wind version of the poster, the Donald Glute novelization. It was the Gone with the Wind version of the poster. It's the blue cover. That's the, I think I still have it, to be honest. But I, I don't know if it's the version that has Lando on it or not. I can't remember. 
but that was the version of the book that I had. It was the blue cover. As a matter of fact, why don't I see? I'm going to see right now because now I want to know. I want to know if I had Lando on it or not because uh, I think it did. Novelization. Let's see. That was it. And yes, it is. That is the book. That is the book that I got. The 1980 novelization. It does have Lando on the cover. I guess that was added because that's not on the. Maybe that was always on that painting, but they took it out on the theatrical version. But it's the blue cover, Donald Glute. That was the first one with the white logo with the red Star Wars. That was it. That was the first book I bought, and I did read it before the movie came out, which was bad. I'm a bad person. Um. Let's see. I will. I think I'm going to read one more letter. I'll read one more letter because why not? Because I can. Um, well, this is a good one. I like this letter. It's a good letter. Uh, hi, Rob. I have a question. Can a movie go too far? When does a movie cross the line and go from being acceptable to unacceptable or even in bad taste? The reason I'm asking is that I was talking to a buddy about Friday the 13th. I love that movie. My dad rented it on beta when I was seven years old. And although it scared the dickens out of me at the time, it's the reason why I love horror flicks. On the other hand, my buddy called it trash. Now, this is not surprising. Slasher movies are not for everyone. But what got me is not only did he not like the film, he objected to the film even being made. I said it was art and freedom of expression, but his argument was that some subjects should not be depicted in film and the gratuitous murdering of people is one of them. Now I've always been of the opinion that art is a place where you can experience things that you cannot experience in real life. Nobody would approve of a psychopathic killer murdering teenagers in every possible way imaginable in real life, but in a fictional book or a movie, it is not a problem because everyone knows it's not real. Besides, if you can use a movie to evoke laughter, what is wrong with using a movie to evoke fear or lust or disgust? My buddy probably would not understand why anybody would even want to evoke such emotions, but it is the human experience. If it is done in a safe environment, as it is while watching a movie, I don't see what the problem is. However, he does bring up a good question. Can a movie go too far? You know what? I regret reading this letter now because this should have been the topic of my next chat. You know what? I'm going to do that. I'm going to stop reading your letter because I'm too, I'm too, uh, I'm too interested in this in this letter. You know what, Luke? Everyone, I'm going to bring this chat to. Hang on, I'll see if somebody else sent in. I think this is a good. Luke's letter is going to be the topic because it's a good letter and he gets into a lot more that I haven't read yet. So no one's don't send any more super chats or anything. I'm going to bring this one to a close. This is Luke Beckett's letter. Is what I'm going to tomorrow's. Rob observations is going to be about can a movie go too far? I love this idea, Luke, and this is a great letter. And boy, you start to mention some good stuff. This is a great letter, great compelling letter. It's the stuff that I love of Rob. Boy, I look really red today. Uh, I guess because my lighter's on. I don't know, whatever. Um, anyway, I'm going to bring this chat to a, a close. This would be Rob observations number 212. My God, I can't believe it. These chats are, of course, brought to you by Lucky Tiger Man's grooming products for those men who want to look good and feel great. I, I want to thank everybody who is here. Um, I want to thank my great moderating staff that makes this such a great place to be. The Honorable Mayor Mike Bodden of Riverdale, Iowa. Detective Jim Boyers. I want to thank Terry in the UK, who we like to call affectionately our D'Artagnan, back from his grail quest. And, of course, Mr. Greg Smith. And if you need a house built from hand by one dude, well, with some help, Greg Smith is your man. He's also building a one-to-one -one scale snow speeder for the Emerald City Comic Con in 2020. So the moderating staff is great. I love them. Thank them for being here. Thank them for me because they do a great job. I want to thank everybody for writing letters. If you like these chats, please hit like. Please hit subscribe. If you don't, you know you can tell me so in the comments everywhere. People do. You can tweet me at Burnett RM. Follow me on Instagram at RM Burnett. Or go to my website, thebrunettework.net, send me letters, do whatever you want. I'm here for you. I am for you, Lieutenant Diamato. if you remember that third season episode of Star Trek. I'll be back tomorrow. I will be on the John Champ John Champion Show. John Campia Show. John Champion does a Star Trek podcast, but I'm not on that one. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here. And remember, every person you meet has a story to tell you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen to them. 
And once again, thanks for being here for observations number 112. Rob observations to show about something. My God. Uh, anyway, I will say, as I always do, have a better day. <laughs>